So, hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Rebecca Graves Bizatol. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of the Office of International Programs. And let me first start out by offering my congratulations. Uh, we're really excited to welcome you to Princeton for Princeton Education. Um, and so we're very much looking forward to hearing your questions about the Novogratz Bridge Year Program. It's a really unique opportunity. But since your interest in that sort of indicates an interest in all things national, I wanted to just take a quick minute to tell you how Princeton can be the gateway to the world for you as a student here. Um, so the Office of International Programs, which is organizes the programs for undergraduate students, really covers you from pre-matriculation through the Novogratz Bridge Year Program through uh, graduation. Uh, we have the Bridger Program. We'll hear a lot about that to come. Uh, we also have semester, year, and summer study abroad. So this is kind of bearing programs abroad. We have the International Internship Program, which happens during the summer. Uh, it is an opportunity to take, pace, to, take, to take part in a professional opportunity in an international organization, um, ranging from research in a lab to working for a global health nonprofit to working for um, working on a kind of summer program for a business school you know, all kinds of different opportunities. Uh, and we also have the Office of Fellowship Advising, which helps students really think about what opportunities that are funded by a variety of different organizations might help them really reach their career goals after Princeton. So we really do cover you from before graduate, before matriculation to post-graduation. And the two things I just want to mention, the strengths of our program are really a kind of very personalized, tailored advising. We have amazing advisors who really sit down with students and help them match the program that they're interested in to their individual academic, professional, and personal goals. And that's something that I don't think all schools can offer and that we offer uh, in a really um, amazing and supportive way. Um, also, I would say we also have a, a lot of resources to help with the funding. So all of these opportunities are available to all of our students, regardless of their, um, you know, family's financial circumstances. So that's also something that's really important. Um, so, you know, all of those things are 100% true, but we are talking today in the midst of a very particular set of um, circumstances, right? We're talking to each other on Zoom. Um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm sure that, that you and your family are wondering, you know, what does that mean for Bridge Year? What does that mean for other international programs that I might want to take part in at Princeton? And so what I'd like to say just to start out is that we as an institution um, and as a program and as the Office of International Programs are really, uh, you know, engaged in a process of kind of planning and parallel planning. Um, we, we are definitely planning to move forward with the Novogratz Bridge Year Program. We're thinking about some modifications that might be realistic in terms of making sure that we can fulfill as much as possible the mission of the program, but react meaningfully to the, to the, to the global situation. One of those things that we're thinking about is probably a, something of a later start date. We have traditionally started in August, late August, but now we're looking more at sort of a little bit later in the year which would allow us to, to move forward. We're also considering the locations of the programs and what will be, um, you know, which sites will be places that are most likely to be available for us to kind of continue the program. So those are things that we're definitely thinking about. Um, as you know, as you've experienced yourself, the situation changes week to week. Um, but what we can definitely do is promise to be transparent about our plan A's and our plan B's at the moments where you have to make important choices um, for yourself going forward. So we're going to be very clear about our expectations for what the program will look like, most particularly before we ask you to commit to the program. Um, so I just wanted to give you that, that, that kind of, you know, perspective, because I know I'm sure it's something that's on your minds and on the minds of your, of your family. Uh, as you as you consider this. Um, but with that, I am very happy to turn this over to the director of our Bridge Year program, Don Luria, uh, and to our students and to Matt Lynn, our associate director, um, to talk more about the phenomenal, unique, and really transformational program that is the Novogratz Bridge Year program. So I'm gonna put on my mute and let it away. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dean Graves said, I'm John Luria. Uh, the director of Princeton University's Novogratz Bridge Year Program. And I just wanted to say a, a quick hello and thanks to all 
uh, for particip participating in tonight's virtual panel. Um, we are very excited um, to have an opportunity to speak with you this evening about Bridge Year as we prepare for what will be our 12th year offering the program to members of the incoming undergraduate class here at the university. Um, I think you all know the basics of the program by now. Uh, we offer a tuition free opportunity for incoming first year Princeton students to spend an academic year living, learning, and engaging with local communities and community service organizations at one of our five international program sites in, in Bolivia, China, India, Indonesia, and Senegal. Um, I've been director since the program's inception, um, and I feel incredibly lucky to have been witness to uh, the wide ranging and, and quite transformational uh, ways in which our program alumni, um, who now number over 300, um, have learned and grown through this program. Um, by building personal relationships and, and working closely with others in an international context, um, Bridger participants have a very unique opportunity to um, acquire valuable life experience and self-awareness, um, language skills, a greater global perspective, um, as well as a much deeper appreciation for something that is um, very important here at Princeton, um, and that is an understanding of how we can be of service to others in our lives. Um, I'm sure that you will hear from the students on the panel tonight uh, that Bridger was an amazing learning experience. And I'm also certain that, they, that you'll hear um, um, that the program challenged them in a variety of ways, uh, both expected and unexpected. Uh, indeed, a lot of the pedagogy behind an experiential program like ours has to do with taking students outside of their comfort zone um, and we believe it's in that zone that a lot of positive reflection and learning can take place. Um, I recognize that as an incoming student, uh, the challenges that Bridger and more broadly that Princeton present can feel a bit daunting, um, but I wanna assure you that along with the challenge um, comes a great deal of support. Um, and on Bridge Year, that comes by way of a professional team of, of onsite staff who work with you throughout the program, uh, homestay site families, service site mentors, uh, your fellow Bridger participants who are learning and growing right alongside you, um, as well as Matt Lynn, Barbara McFarlane, and myself in the Bridger office, um, our faculty fellows, our colleagues in the office of the Dean of the College, um, our partners in campus life, and, and last but not least, our, our diverse and vibrant community of program alumni. Um, I, I suppose I'm gonna wrap it up for now um, and, and just say that, that for me, an undergraduate education can and should be a journey of exploration, discovery, and growth. Um, and I hope that as you're thinking about how you want to begin your time at Princeton and, and what you want to make out of the journey um, that is your Princeton education, that you'll consider uh, the Novogratz Bridger program. Um, so thanks again. Um, congratulations on your admission to Princeton. And I'll turn things over now to Matt Lynn, our assistant director. Hello everyone. Um, thank you, Dean Graves and John Luria for um, the introductions to the Office of International Programs and to uh, the Bridger program. Um, and thank you to our three student panelists um, who will introduce themselves in a few minutes. Um, first, I wanna discuss just a few housekeeping things um, as we get the, this panel started. Um, as an attendee, you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A function, which is on the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, I see that some of you have already um, begun asking some questions, so that's great. Um, our panelists are gonna introduce themselves. Um, they're gonna have approximately five minutes each to do that, and then we'll start um, taking questions. So maybe even some of your questions will be answered in their intros or in the intros that um, Dean Graves or John Luria just made. Um, so another thing to keep in mind that I wanna remind everyone of a recording of this um, presentation is being made um, and we'll have a recording available with captions um, online in a couple of days, which we'll share with you via email. Um, so if that is, um, yeah, something that you need, then consider that. But um, 
Please know that if your questions aren't answered tonight, you can always contact us at uip at princeton.edu. You'll also notice that um, each of us um, on the panel tonight have our email addresses in um, the, the name tags on our, um, on our speech boxes. And so you can feel free to reach out to us um, individually with questions as well if something um, impacts you about uh, what a particular panelist has to speak on. Um, before I introduce our three panelists, I just want to remind everyone of the application deadline, which is May 3rd. Um, it's coming up very soon, so be sure um, to get your questions to us, to notify your references if you're considering applying, and to um, prepare your application materials for that May 3rd deadline. Um, so I'm going to switch it over to gallery view for just a second more so you can all see who's um, with us tonight. You can ask um, throughout the course of the night, you can ask anyone here, um, including Dean Graves and John Luria, questions um, about the program or about the Office of International Programs. Um, but the most important part of tonight is the student experience and the, the experiences that um, these wonderful program alums had while they were abroad. Um, tonight we have with us um, Noel Ping, who did the Bolivia program, uh, Layla Owens, who did the India program, and Luke Bunday, who did the China program. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over um, to Noel to, to, to begin the introductions. Um, thanks, Noel. Hi, everyone. Um, congratulations on being accepted into Princeton. It's super exciting. Um, like Matt said, my name is Noelle. Um, I went to Bolivia uh, two years ago, so I'm a sophomore now. Um, and I actually just declared my major, so I'm going to be studying Spanish um, with focuses on like American studies. I'm also hoping to pursue certificates in creative writing and also music performance. Um, so if anyone has questions about you know, like the impact of going on a program to a country where you don't know the language at all. Um, I didn't know any Spanish before going to Bolivia and now it's my major. So um, just like an example of how um, really how Bridger has like shaped my time here at Princeton. Um, so when I was in Bolivia, oh, by the way, I'm in California. So that's why it's very bright daylight and also really beautiful out today. Um, but yeah, I, when I was in Bolivia, I worked at the service site called Infante. Um, I worked specifically in their um, sort of offshoot program called Casa de la Mujer. They worked with women and like adolescent women who had been survivors of sexual violence. Um, they worked with local government departments like the police and also social, social workers to ensure that the women that kind of passed through our house um, had access to legal services if they wanted to press charges. Um, and also worked a lot with um, certain private institutions that also housed um, girls who had to basically be sheltered in places that were not their family homes because of the um, situations that they were in. Um, but the most important part of the service site was actually the therapy that the girls underwent. Um, so Casa Luga Mujer was like very small and they're very focused on therapy. That's kind of their big thing. So my main job there was actually working um, with the head psychologist um, and she had a big focus on alternative therapy. She had a big focus on sort of holistic group work. And so a lot of my work during that time was focused on um, basically community work against gender-based violence. I was working directly with the girls as well by the end of my service program. Um, and also building really strong relationships with um, basically helping to form very strong, a very strong community with the girls who were all a part of that program. Um, and so I led a variety of workshops. I got an inside look at how um, sort of the bureaucracy of the Bolivian sort of city system worked in terms of things like domestic and sexual violence. Um, and yeah, just basically had a really, really amazing, really difficult, really immersive, and really beautiful experience working there. Um, my host family was very small. Um, in the beginning of the year, it was just a mom and a dad. And by the end of the year, there was a two month old child. And so I was there during the pregnancy of the mother from all the way from the end of her pregnancy to basically watching him grow up. It was really beautiful. It was really amazing. Um, definitely had a lot of challenges there as well, but I think um, the host family situation was something that really, really impacted me. It taught me a lot about um, what it means to sort of put myself in a place 
where I am living with people that I have never known before and also who are culturally very, very different from me, I'm sort of challenging my own ability to understand like the place that my body has in a country like that. Um, something else I'd also say is that Brajir is definitely um, like the kind of, I, I hear a lot of people saying like, I don't understand how you can take a gap year. It seems like kind of like a waste of a year. And I like, I just want to start off this web this webinar by saying that um, I do not at all think of Brigier or any kind of gap year as a waste. It is 100% like beneficial to you. It is such an amazing program. Um, I really highly encourage anybody who's even slightly considering the possibility to just go for it. Um, really, can it's it's impacted me from the moment I stepped into that country until right now. I'm still processing it. I'm still learning from it. I'm still learning for myself. Um, that's something I can go off like sort of deeper into later. But yeah, um, and again. And that's all I have for now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Noel. Um, Lila, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I would love to. Um, as my, Matt might have just mentioned, my name's Layla. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and I did bridge year in India last year. So I'm currently a freshman at Princeton. Uh, I study civil and environmental engineering, uh, focusing on the environmental part of that perhaps because of bridge year um, and other things I like to do on campus uh, include teaching uh, ESL in Trenton and I'm also a member of the club tennis team um, outside of campus another extracurricular I do um, that's also part of the reason um, I wanted to do bridge year and I think I gained a lot from the experience is I work for a um, global peace NGO called CISV um, I, I've done a lot over the years through them. Uh, my current role is sort of building, um, I'm on like a leadership development team and I work with the West region of the US um, to help like, people, you know, like write, I don't know, do programming that um, focuses on like youth and educational experiences uh, that can like teach about global issues. Um, and on Bridge Year, uh, a lot of a lot of things impacted me, most of all the people. Uh, so I wanted just to like give a brief overview of not only like what I did, but like who I did it with. Uh, and so to start off my service site, I worked for an NGO called Jethan Sunstam. Um, and I was working on a menstrual health campaign. And it was super impactful for me because it's not something I thought a lot about prior to going to India at all was um, in my own menstrual health, how uh, we educate people about that, how we are like using sustainable products. Uh, so the like coolest part about that for me was getting to go into the community where um, the NGO had a um, like reusable pad production site. And so it was, it was in a sort of like slumish area that was really close to our program house. And the program house is like where you go for um, breakfast. We, that's where I took like Hindi classes, like kind of a central uh, location. And so it was like close, so close to like where I went every day. I didn't know that this it existed in, until I started going there for my service site. And it was really cool to get to like meet those women who I sometimes would like pass on my commute uh, and really like get to know them um, and see how this, this um, project of like sewing their own um, like menstrual pads, it was really impactful for them. And I actually am really lucky because my mentor for um, the service site, she was um, like very into the intellectual side of things as well. And so in addition to having me like work on the ground level grassroots uh, work, I actually got to present some of the work that the NGO did at the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research in Colorado at a conference they had after coming back from Bridgier. Uh, which is something that like, I never would have expected to do um, prior to bridge here. Uh, so those are just some of the people that shaped that experience. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was my um, independent enrichment activity or IEA. Um, I chose to do stone carving for that and actually you can see in my background I have this bird here hand carved by me. Um, I have some other pieces too but the bird is my favorite um, and I, as you might have heard me say earlier, I'm an engineer and so I never um, thought of myself as like an artist uh, and so Bridge Year also kind of challenged me in that way. I got to know a lot of the like local art community 
um because udaipur which is the city where we were based uh, is very touristy and so actually like these art vendors have um like a big role in the city and so it was really cool for me to get to know that as well as learn a cool new skill <clears throat> excuse me um um, other things that were really impactful, obviously my my host family, um, Noelle said it pretty well that this is going to be like one of the most uh, impactful parts of the program, in my opinion. Um, and I, I have an older brother at home here in Detroit, and I was really cool for me to have some younger siblings while I was in India, and I got to really engage with them a lot, and we still talk frequently. So it's a little bit about me. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so as you all can already tell, like Bridger students do amazing things and are, are from a lot of different backgrounds and have a lot of different interests. So um, Luke, would you like to um, finish us out with the introductions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for coming and joining us today. So my name is Luke, I'm from Minnetonka, Minnesota, and I was a participant in Bridge of China last year, so I'm a first year right now. Um, to tell you a little bit about what I do at Princeton right now, um, I'm planning to study molecular biology with the goal of doing research in the future. Um, and besides academics, I'm involved with the Asian American Student Association, as well as the Suicide Prevention Hotline for Mercer County, which is the county where Princeton is located. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my bridge year experience, though maybe save some of the details for the question and answer. So Bridge Year China is located in um, Kunming, which is the um, capital city of Yunnan province in southwestern China. Um, and I worked at a local NGO called the Pesticides Equal Alternative Center, or PEAK for short. Um, and PEAK is a group that's um, prime focus is trying to educate local farmers about um, how to apply pesticides and other agricultural chemicals in a way that's both healthy for um, for the farmers themselves, that's um, 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 protective of the human health and as well as protective of the environmental health. Um, so my work there focused primarily on translating documents between English and Chinese, as well as providing subtitles for different videos about organic agriculture in order to help provide some of that education. I also taught English twice a week to elementary school kids, um, which was something that I did in a shop that Peak runs. So Peak runs a shop selling organic products um, produced by farmers that it works with. And then as incentive to get people to come to the store, they provide free English lessons taught by a Princeton student um, if you sign up to be a long-term um, customer at the shop. Um, and then in my free time, I worked um, in a barber shop actually. Um, so that IEAs that um, Layla was just talking about are very diverse and you can kind of do whatever you can think of. So that was something that was really cool for me. I worked in a barber shop um, and really got to know my coworkers there. Um, and that was an important community for me outside of the others that I was involved with as part of the program. I also played soccer in a league of expats and learned pottery. Um, so Noelle and Layla talked a bit about some of their highlights from the program. So I thought maybe I could talk a bit about kind of where I was in my thought process when I was thinking about applying to Bridger because I think that's probably on a lot of your guys' minds right now. Um, so when I was considering whether to apply to, um, to the Bridger program, I had kind of thought of three main reasons why I would want to do it. The first was that it was going to be a break from school. Um, so I'm sure all of you have different experiences, but for me, by the time I graduated, I was feeling a little burnt out um, academically. Um, I went to a public high school in Minnesota, but I did a dual enrollment program at the University of Minnesota. So I did four semesters there um, and that was pretty wearisome. So by the time I graduated, um, I was kind of um, feeling ready for a break from the academic treadmill. Um, so that was one component. And then the second component is that um, I thought Bridger would be a really good opportunity to connect with some of my family's cultural heritage. So my mom is Taiwanese. Um, 
but because I grew up in Minnesota, I didn't necessarily have a lot of opportunities to connect with that side of my heritage a lot. Um, I only really saw my family from Taiwan a few times a year or a few times every few years. Um, so that was a really big draw of Ridger for me, kind of just this opportunity to spend a whole year immersed in this culture and learning the language um, as a way to reconnect with a lot of roots that I hadn't explored um, previously. And then the third component that really drew me was service. So service has been something that I thought was really important to me for a lot of my life. And Bridger is kind of the epitome of um, a really reflective and kind of in-depth and thorough take on um, what it means to do service. So I had a lot of thoughts about service, doing service and what that meant before the program. And then doing the program helped me really develop those ideas even further and change my perspective a lot. Um, so like Noel said, if you're at all thinking about it, I think you should really just go for it and apply because like this opportunity is so exciting and so unique. Um, basically, um, um, we can talk about it more in the Q&A, but I think most of the qualms that people have in thinking about applying um, really kind of evaporate with really early on in the program once you actually are a participant. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'll say for now. And yeah, turn it back over to Matt. Thanks, Luke. Um, I'm going to switch back to gallery view just for a moment so everyone can see the, the panelists before we jump into the questions. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you for those introductions. Uh, and I just want to say that, um, as you may know, we, we also um, have two other program locations, Indonesia and, and Senegal, um, which aren't represented on the panel, um, mostly because of time and, and just, you know, um, being able to have a lot of voices in the room is um, puts up some different challenges, but um, feel free to reach out to us. We can connect you to a program alumni um, from one of those uh, program sites, um, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about those specific locations um, following this this panel. Um, so we have a lot of great questions. Um, let's see. One of the first questions we have is, um, what was one of your biggest the biggest challenges that you faced while you were on bridge year and what were some of the things you did to navigate um, those challenges um, and it looks like noel might be ready to answer that question yeah sure um definitely a really loaded one and a super important one um and i think it is going to depend a lot based on the person but i would say for me the biggest challenge and there's like categories within this one challenge um it's just sort of the huge like change in identity that i had to undergo basically once i um left home and i think that's something i really wasn't expecting because i think at least for me i graduated high school um i grew up in a pretty like a pretty sheltered town i grew up in a pretty sheltered family um every part of me was itching to get out um, and so when i left for bridge year i didn't expect to feel such a sense of displacement and such a sense of like insecurity in who I was um, and in my own identity when I was when I went to a new country. Um, I expected the normal things like culture shock, like not being able to speak the language um, or not fully being able to like completely connect with people initially, but I didn't realize how much of an impact that would have on like my personal identity and how I felt I fit, how, how I felt that like made me basically fit into the country and with the people that I was there with. And so um, I think for me, this idea of like when you leave home, you leave behind not just like a physical place, but a lot of the emotional ties that you make with that place, a lot of the relationships that define you, um, a lot of the things that make you feel like you know who you are, they kind of are torn away from you, so to speak, when you go to a new country. And that's not something that, at first that was the hardest part, and I think um, that's actually one of the greatest things that was ever given to me though on the program, um, because I had to really, for an entire nine months, really think about um, what was important to me and like basically tear everything, every kind of like um, stereotype or label I had put on myself before this experience and rebuild myself back up with things that I actually felt were genuine to me and that was only possible by going on this program and being in a place where I was completely um, 
in a lot of ways alone, but also very, very supported by the people that I was there with. Um, and so, I mean, one of the big identity markers is, of course, language. And I think, um, I mean, I grew up in a multilingual household, sort of. I grew up speaking Chinese. I went to school and I had to start speaking English. I learned French all the way from middle through high school. And so I went into Bolivia not being able to speak any Spanish. Um, and so that was one of the biggest ones was I didn't realize before then how much my identity was sort of tied around being able to really connect with and talk to people. And so when I first went to Bolivia, not being able to really talk to my host family the way that I wanted to, not being able to talk to um, my service site, basically boss, um, and really express myself the way that I wanted to because I was lacking that language. That was really, really difficult. And it took a lot of um, being kind to myself and being able to understand that I was in a learning process and for the first time in my life I had to be okay with being in that uncomfortable space um, of not always being able to be understood, of not always being able to know exactly how to say something, of knowing that maybe I was going to be misunderstood and that was okay. Um, I think Bridger is an experience where you have to be okay with not always having the answer and not always being perfectly comfortable with yourself and who you are because it's completely a process. Um, and it's things are going to be changing you're going to constantly be changing you're going to constantly be questioning things and i think i grew up at least very um comfortable with the idea that i would know sorry i'm getting it um i was i was i grew up very comfortable with the idea that um i was going to know the answers to everything and that i was going to know exactly who i was and what i wanted to do and bridger kind of told me you can't do that and you can't and it's a good thing that you don't always know um the answer to everything and you don't know how to like exactly where you fit in yet and so i think that was one of the biggest ones um i also just want to slightly mention for anybody who's out there um i was also one of two people of color in my group and so navigating that in bolivia was um, in and of itself also a very difficult thing um, but i was very lucky to have um a lot of support and a lot of communication your group by the way the group that you go to on bridge year with they will be in your life forever in some capacity or not i have met lifelong friends there um and also, I think one of the other big challenges was also being a woman um, in Bolivia as well. It's not an easy place to be a woman. That's true for everywhere in the world. Um, and that's that was also another thing that I had to sort of um, deal with. But if anybody has specific questions about that, they can email me or reach out because I'd love to talk more. Um, but I think my time is up and I'd like to pass this on to someone else. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Noelle. It's, it's certainly not... Um, you know, easy to, to talk about challenges in such a short amount of time, but I appreciate um, you highlighting a few of those that you experienced on the program. Um, and thanks for offering to, to speak to people um, afterwards about that. Um, well, it looks like we have a lot more questions, so that's great. And I, just to reiterate, we probably won't get to all of these questions tonight, um, but please do reach out. We really encourage you to reach out in the coming days. We are here to answer your questions. Um, but there's a question about what it's like to live with a homestay family. Um, and it looks like um, Layla's willing to answer that question. Yeah, um, I really love talking about the homestay family experience on Bridge Year because I think it's honestly one of the most like formative parts. Um, and I think that when you're living with a family, of course, like how Noah was saying, you know, not everything's going to be easy, and that's completely okay. That's kind of the point is to challenge yourself. Um, and living with a homestay family, for me, it's it's the difference between going and like visiting somewhere and really living there. Uh, and part of the reason, like I was so sad leaving my homestay family um, and just like the program in general, was that I genuinely felt like I was like at home in their house and like in the city as a whole. You know, like there's something different about like, um going to the grocery store to like buy like a mango which is something i would do uh and running into people that you know like that's i don't know one of the reasons um to clarify people i know like through my my, my homestay family um because not not only are you like living with them um so like you get to know them during like that experience but for me a lot of like the people i'm i met was through them so like they would take me to um, family members' houses, weddings was a big deal um, in India. You will be there for wedding season uh, and it will be fun. Um, and just getting to like make connections with, with people that you, like, you otherwise wouldn't uh, is something that I found super valuable. 
Um, Noelle was talking a little bit about the language uh, barrier and how that shaped her experience. And I think that the homestay family um, can be like really beneficial to like pushing, pushing you in that regard too. Uh, I didn't know a word of Hindi before I went to India, which is part of the reason I chose to go there. I actually do speak Spanish, uh, but I wanted to sort of like learn another language and living with a homestay family is a great way um, to do that in like a supportive environment. You know, like you have to like learn to like mime things out and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of alluded to this earlier um, when I talked about having the younger homestay siblings there with me, but um, having like friends who, who aren't the other Princeton people, um, it was really important for me. I would go, um, so I got really into bike riding while I'm bridge here, kind of, kind of a fun fact. Uh, and so I'd go every Sunday morning, like 6 a.m. with my homestay brother. Don't ask me how I did it, but I did it for like the whole six months basically and we would bike around this one lake um and it was it was beautiful we would do it uh weekly and we would come back um and eat samosas together in our house and just that's just like one of the things i miss most um about like india and living with with the host family it was just like the little interactions that, like actually make you feel like a family i would get scolded from the mom you know for for having my hair down in the kitchen because she was very into cleanliness and stuff um and so like there are and at first it like bothered me i was like, like why is she, who is she to tell me like how to how to wear my hair or whatever um and then i kind of got to realize it's kind of like a cultural thing um as well as just like you're part of her family like, the reason she felt comfortable like scolding me about this was because she really thought of me as her daughter and that's something that you just like won't get doing any other kind of program um, and it's a super special thing so that's enough about that <laughs> thanks so much um yeah the 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 homestay experience is is obviously a core component of of the program and a, and a very um impactful element of the program for um for our students and um, so it's a, yeah, it's, there's really amazing experiences that happen within the homestay family and relationships that are formed for life um, between Bridger students and their homestay families. Um, let's see what our, our next question for our students is. Um, so here's a question that is, is pretty common for students applying to Bridger. Um, how is Bridger how has your Bridger experience shaped your time at Princeton so far? Um, um, Luke, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I can talk about this one. Um, so maybe I'll start by just mentioning a few of the things that might be on people's mind, people's minds when they ask this question. Firstly, being like the academics of it and the trans transition back to school after taking a gap year. Um, so that's something that I was thinking about a lot as the program began. Um, and now that I've had the chance to return to school, my observations are basically that it's not a problem. Um, if you talk to Bridger students, um, Bridger alumni, like in varying degrees, um, the transition back to school can be a little strange because it's a lot different, of course, than the experience of Bridger. Um, and you're back into a lot more of a kind of regimented schedule and you're not necessarily as um, kind of doing your daily activities in such a way that you're very closely connected to the things that you find personally meaningful. So like when you're on bridge, your, your daily NGO work is like extremely meaningful and you kind of like your daily activities are directly connected to those meaningful things. Um, whereas back to school, there's kind of a little more of that distance sometimes. Um, but as far as the transition, it's, it's relatively smooth i'd say for most people so going back to school i definitely had missed school on bridge year a little um and it was nice to get back into it and then this past year i've been taking the integrated science curriculum which is um one of the kind of more difficult things you can do as a freshman it covers um, chemistry biology physics and computer science um over the course of the school year um but I did not feel behind anyone who was coming straight from high school. And like, I did need to review some things from high school, but that wasn't like a big hurdle or anything. Um, okay, other 
components um, to this question about how it shaped my time at Princeton. Um, I think another thing people might be thinking about is like, is it strange to enter um, college a year behind like all of your friends from high school? Um, and I'd say that was definitely an adjustment. Um, but in a lot of ways, you can think about it as a blessing because now you have all these friends from high school who are sophomores and who have gone through freshman year and who you can really get advice from. Um, and then on a kind of tangent of that, one thing that really stuck with me from bridge year is that you develop these really close personal bonds with a lot of people while you're in country. So um, Noah and Leila talked about the bonds you form within your group and then the bonds you form within your home state and in other communities. And those bonds, um, like the depth of those bonds really kind of demonstrated to me how far you can take certain relationships. So actually being on bridge year kind of opened my eyes to where I could grow in some of my friendships from high school. So you might worry that you'll grow more distant with a lot of your friends from high school. That may be the case for some friends, but for a lot of friends actually coming back from bridge year, I was able to connect with them on like a lot deeper of a level after having had the experience of bridge year. Um, and the last piece I'll just mention, I, like you could really talk about this question for a long time, I think, um, because bridge year is kind of front and center in my mind a lot of the time, even today. Um, but I think bridge year really helped me build like a habit of introspection the program does a really good job of like first exposing you to all these amazing new experiences but then also having like this checkpoint where it's like okay let's stop and reflect on this um and reflect on it really thoughtfully with a group of people who you can trust and um talk um honestly with and so i've kind of kept up with that habit since i got to princeton so i started journaling in china and um, I continue to journal now that I'm on campus, and so that's a really good way for me to process my thoughts um, as I encounter new experiences at Princeton. Um, yeah, I'll stop there to, so we can get to more questions. Great, thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, I think that's a big area of question for, for folks, um, what it's going to be like to take a year off and what it's going to be like to come back into Princeton a year later, so thanks for um, taking that question, Luke. Um, we have a question um, that I'm going to um, turn over to uh, John Luria and, and possibly Dean Graves. Um, what, what systems are set in place to ensure the safety of the participants on the Bridge Year program? John, would you like to start off with that one? Um, so I guess I'll start off by saying that student health and safety is a top priority for the program. Um, we want to create a healthy, safe, and engaging learning environment, and, and students aren't really able to learn unless we can um, assure a certain level of health and safety. And, and we approach student health and safety and general risk management in a number of different ways. It's, it starts off with our um, selection of our program partner. Um, we partner at our five Bridger locations with an organization called Where There Be Dragons. Um, and we specifically partner with them because they have um, years of experience working at these different program sites, um, managing student experiences, um, and the emergency and safety protocols in place, which allow us to run the program. Um, we also focus a lot of attention on, on student orientation and preparing students uh, for the experience, experiences that they're going to have. I mean, obviously um, you can't prepare students for everything. And I often tell students at the start of the orientation that um, if at the end of the orientation, they feel like they've been prepared to be somewhat unprepared, we, we've done our job. Um, but then beyond orienting students um, to the experience, uh, I'd say the last part is our, our emergency response. Um, uh, for um, uh, folks who are interested, um, I, I'd say the most common health concern that students face while in the program it has to do with gastrointestinal distress. Um, we have a very close um, working relationship with University Health Services um, at Princeton. Um, they're an important partner for us. Um, and so we have strict protocols about um, if a student is sick for more than a couple of days, they see a local healthcare provider. 
um, and then reports from uh, about their care locally um, get sent to our office. We share them with um, uh, with uh, with University Health Services and help manage um, student health in that way. Uh, for larger um, uh, issues or or or, or um, and more complicated concerns um, at Princeton, we have. Uh, a unit called uh, the Global Safety and Security Unit out of the um, uh, Office of the Provost. Um, and we partner very closely with them on all aspects of uh, managing risk and student health and safety. Um, we also are a member of an organization called International SOS. And so we would rely on International SOS for um, support um, in terms of access to healthcare or other emergency type responses. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years, and um, I think we have a lot of really uh, solid system in place to do that. Um, but if you or your families have any uh, follow-up questions about that or want to talk about um, specific concerns or, or, or health situations, um, my email is in my um, name uh, box at the, at the bottom. Um, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm, I'm happy to talk. Thanks so much, John. I'll only add one thing, which is I have two sons. They are the light of my life, the apple of my eye, and um, they they are not taken care of with the care and attention of the Bridger students <laughs> as much as I care about them. And I've been thoroughly uh, impressed with the level of attention and the level of support at all levels, from the very simple issue to the very complex issue. Um, I can definitely assure you that there are all of the resources of Princeton University brought to bear to take care of the students. Thank you um, for that important answer. Um, so I'm going to try to move through questions quickly now because um, there's a lot and we only have a short amount of time left. Um, but I think this is an important question. Um, how do surface service placements get decided and what is a typical day at um, a service site look like? Um, would, um, would you like to start on that one, Layla? Sure, I can take that. Um, so actually when you first get there um, to your location, you're gonna get to go and look at each of the service sites uh, and you get to meet with the people who work there, hear their presentation um, and you, you get to read I was the first year of, of the program in the new city, so I didn't get to do this, but you will get to read uh, other students' comments about the um, NGOs, like what they thought was helpful working there. Uh, and then after you've gone, seen all of the NGOs, it takes uh, probably about a week, maybe even two, um, you get to rank your um, NGOs and uh, like say any like special skills you, you might have. So for example, um, the NGO I was working with, it's generally just a NGO um, up for like youth empowerment. And it's like a grassroots organization. Um, so I've worked with youth in the past um, doing like experiential education things. So it was like a, a nice fit for me. Um, there was some people in our group who are interested in like medicine and there was a um, like NGO working on like um, traditional medicine type thing. So that's what they got paired with, you know, so it's, it's really a collaborative um, thing between both you, the sites uh, and your instructors while you're there. Cause I mean, the, the best thing is to, like keep everyone happy. Um, and honestly, if I had ended up at a different service site, um, I would not have minded. They're all unique in their own ways. And something I learned is that it's, it's what you make of it, you know? So if you're at somewhere and you don't necessarily like the work you're doing, um, you you are able to sort of like pivot, change what you do, work with the organization. Um, you know, the, it's a very um, like flexible sort of situation. Don't ever feel trapped into, oh, I must write this one report because my supervisor asked me to, you know. Um, it's, I don't know, beneficial for everyone. Uh, I forget if there was more to the question, but I think I'll stop there. Oh, wait, it's asked about the daily routine. Um, it depends on um, per service site. For me, my work started um, at like 9 a.m. So I would have handy class from eight to nine and I would bike over there super fast, usually a few minutes late, not a big deal. Um, I would, uh, on the days I was working in the main office, because I said there was a main office in the PAB production center. So if I was working in the main office, um, I would 
go type up whatever report I had. They gave me a computer. I did not bring my own laptop uh, to India. They like gave me one when I got there. Um, I would do that for the morning. Um, lunchtime would come. It was the cutest thing. So everyone has their packed lunch, right? Um, they're in a little like tiffin is what it's called uh, in India. And so we would all take out our tiffins and set them on this one table. Um, and then we would eat using like roti, which is the, the like Indian bread, but you can eat from like anyone's lunch box basically. It was like a little communal lunch, um, super fun. And then after that, I would go on a walk around the block with my coworkers every day. Um, and then go back to finish the rest of the work day. That's, that's it. Thanks so much. Um, it looks like Noelle wants to say something about her, her service experience as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add a quick, um, what Layla said about the lunchtime just made me think about um, something that's really special about going on bridge year in the different individual countries is um, being able to work like a sort of like a normal everyday person, you really get a feel for the individual flavor of each country and how they kind of go about their normal day. Um, so in Bolivia, at least it was one of my favorite things was, um, so Bolivia has sort of, lunch is the most important meal in Bolivia. And so um, typically people don't actually eat lunch at work. They all go home um, to eat lunch at home with their family. And so there's like a two, three hour, sometimes three, three hour long lunch break for every single day of work. Um, and so one of my best memories was just like going to work in the morning and then going home for lunch with my entire family, taking a nap, which is amazing. You're never gonna be able to do that ever again. Um, and then going back to work in the afternoon. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there are a fair number of questions about the application process. Um, so I just wanna to speak to um, a few of those and um, hopefully answer a lot of your questions about those and then hopefully we'll have um, a little bit of time for one or two more questions for the um, student panelists. Um, so some of the questions are around the competitive, competitiveness of the application process, um, how many people apply and what kinds of things we are looking for in um, applicants to the program. Um, so we can say that normally um, in most years, somewhere between 85 to 90 folks apply to the program. Um, you know, we're in the new reality that we're um, living with, with uh, COVID-19, we're unsure what that might um, look like, but um, we usually interview um, between 14 and 15 people for each program location. Um, once applications are, are read, we select you for an interview. Um, and we're not really looking for one particular aspect. Um, we're looking for um, a variety and a diversity of experiences and perspectives uh, and, um, you know, ways that you've pushed yourself outside of your comfort zone and um, you don't have to be proficient in a particular language of a place where you're going. You don't have to know much about the place where you're going. Um, you don't have to have previous international travel experience to apply to the program. Um, you know, we're looking for people who are open-minded and flexible and um, resilient and resourceful and um, interested in intercultural communication and intercultural dialogue and interested in, um, of course, interested in um, community engagement and relationship building and public service and thinking about how to um, more effectively serve uh, communities. Um, and so those are kind of some of the key um, elements that we're looking for in a Bridger applicant. Nothing, um, you know, specific or one type of person that, that we're looking for. Um, John, would you like to add to that one? Yeah, I was just going to say as, a, as somebody who both reads and interviews applicants, um, we get a lot of questions about um, site selection. And so I just wanted to say that if you go into the application website, if you haven't been there already, um, there's an opportunity to preference program sites. So you can say, uh, Bolivia is my first choice, Indonesia is my second choice, etc. cetera. Um, if you know that you only want to be considered for one program site, there's absolutely no problem with just selecting that as your first preference and then selecting all other sites um, as um, would not accept a placement at this um, 
at this program location. Um, that's really helpful to readers as we're trying to uh, select students for specific um, uh, interviews for a specific program site. Um, so when we do offer interviews, which will happen sometime in the middle of May, um, and interviews will take place in the beginning of June, um, we'll offer an interview for a specific program site. Um, once we finish through the interview, we'll make a selection of um, uh, students who will offer a placement on the program. Uh, the offer is non-binding, so you have a few days in which you can decide whether you want to accept the offer of participation or not. Um, and so um, if a student decides, a student who we've offered uh, participation to decides that um, they're not um, interested in participating, um, we have a wait list and then, and then we go to the wait list. Um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, one other um, a, a, a piece of advice for the application process, after you select your um, country locations, there's a question about why you made the choices um, that you made in terms of first, second, third, fourth, fifth choices. Um, that's a, a, another helpful aspect of the application. So we kind of understand what it is and it could be something very um, ambiguous or general, but um, what the re what reasons you have for um, and what interest you have in, in selecting those um, specific program sites. Okay. Um, well, we have only a couple of minutes um, left um, on the webinar. Um, so I, I want to um, ask the participants to talk about, um, well not talk about, to say why they did Bridge Year in, in one sentence. Um, Luke, would you like to begin? Okay, um, in one sentence, I did bridge year as a way to recharge from school and to reconnect with family heritage and to gain a global perspective. Thanks. Um, Who would like to go next, Layla? Honestly, I did bridge year because I would have regretted it for the rest of my life if I didn't. Um, I did bridge year because I felt like I had tunnel vision in terms of who I was and what I wanted to do and what my life was going to look like and I needed something that was going to shake me out of that, so. Thanks everyone. Um, well, there's, there's still a lot of great questions and I hope that we answered a lot of your questions and got to some of the key points um, of, of the things you were you were asking um, and please 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 I would encourage um, each of you who is watching to email us at byp at princeton.edu um, for any questions that did not get answered um, I would also encourage you to reach out to um, the, the panelists um, thank you so much, Noel, Luke, and Layla. Um, you're, you're great resources for these students, um, and we really appreciate you. Um, and yeah, I'll turn it over to Dean Graves or John Lurie if they have any last um, um, remarks. But John, you go ahead. I don't have any last words. Just thank you to our panelists and looking forward to meeting all of you. Yeah, and for me, just thanks thanks to everyone for participating in tonight's panel. Um, we hope, again, as Matt said, that we answered your questions. Um, we hope that you'll consider uh, the Novogratz Bridger program, and um, and please be in touch if you have any any lingering concerns. Um, we're happy to to touch base with you individually um, via email or via Zoom chat. Um, so please um, let us know. Thank you. Good night.